what I'd like to do now is uh, kind of get back into this setting apart by God and to go back through some of the places that we've been and see that, it, again, it's not just a, an arbitrary thing. That God has you know, randomly chosen Abram and Isaac and Jacob and, and just kind of put them in this land, set them apart uh, as if there was no reasoning uh, behind it. You know, the law in Leviticus, for example, isn't just given random. Just because there is a sanctifying aspect to it all, whether it's uh, whether it's food or festival, you shall be holy, as I, the Lord your God, am holy. So let's go back again and uh, see some of these examples and see to what end God is setting apart. Genesis chapter two back in the beginning. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished His work that He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work that He had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all His work that He had done and creation. So even woven into the very fabric of creation, into the very week that God creates, God sets apart a specific day for rest. And Jesus will remind us in Mark chapter 3 that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, this set apart day within the week wasn't just for man to sit around and do nothing. And it certainly wasn't what the Pharisees had turned it into where they were essentially doing more work on that day to try to avoid work in the first place. Right? I don't know how many of you are familiar with the mission or have read through it before, but it's fascinating. These rabbis going back and forth in their arguments about what they can and can't do on the Sabbath. You, know, you can't carry something so far, but if you absolutely have to carry something so far, you, know, you can get a Gentile to do it for you. <laughs> um, even today, I don't know if you've seen this too, uh, it's in Jerusalem, there are you know, these, uh, of course, Orthodox, Orthodox Jewish communities uh, you know, in and around New York City, they have the, the cores hanging above the streets to show you how far you know, you can walk, you have to stay within. Of course, they'll go out and make sure everything is intact so you know how far you can walk, where you can carry things as well. This set apart day was for rest. And Jesus again says that this rest is to be found in Him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you Sabbath. Take my yoke upon you and, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy my burden is light this set apart day is literally to Sabbath in Jesus it's a day for them to receive the good things that he has to give namely forgiveness life and salvation Luther says in the large catechism to sanctify the holy day is the same as to keep it holy. But what is meant by keeping it holy? Nothing else than to be occupied with holy words, work, and life. For the day needs no sanctification for itself. It has been created holy in itself, but God desires the day to be holy in you. Therefore, it becomes holy or unholy because of you, whether you are occupied on that day with things that are holy or unholy. How then does this sanctification take place? Not like this, sitting behind the stove and doing no rough work, or adorning ourselves with a wreath and putting on our best clothes. But as said above, we occupy ourselves with God's Word and exercise ourselves in the Word. 
This to him is sanctifying the holy day, being set apart. Luther goes on in this third commandment in the large catechism uh, very well. The large catechism is, in my opinion, some of his best. But he continues, actually, in his commentary in Genesis, telling us more of the Sabbath. See, I can speculate about this mixed multitude because Luther speculates himself all the time, right? Yes. He does. Luther speculates what the garden would have been like had Adam and Eve not fallen into sin. He tells us about this other set-apart tree, which we haven't mentioned yet, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In his commentary on Genesis, he says, So then, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or the place where trees of this kind were planted in large number, would have been the church at which Adam, together with his descendants, would have gathered on the Sabbath day. After refreshing themselves from the tree of life, he would have praised God and lauded him for the dominion over all the creatures of the earth which had been given to mankind. He would have admonished his descendants to live a holy and sinless life, to work faithfully in the garden, to watch it carefully, and to beware with the greatest care of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This outward place, ceremonial, word and worship man would have had. And later he would have returned to his working and guarding until a predetermined time had been fulfilled when he would have been translated to heaven. Yet most pleasure. This gives us kind of an interesting look at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This tree in the garden is not existing to test the seriousness of Adam and Eve's love for God. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil isn't in the garden because of free will or anything like this. Keep my inner Baptist at bay. It's there for further setting apart. It's a matter of faith. And the location at which Adam would have gathered his family to hear the word and to be catechized. So Luther's words got me thinking. Is he inventing some fantasy? I mean, obviously it never plays out this way in the Bible. The fall happened too quickly. So of course I began to, to look. In how many other instances does God's intentional setting apart of his people lead into worship. And as you look, the answer becomes all the time. So let's look at a few of them. We see in these examples, many of them from yesterday, that God's purposes for setting apart lead intentionally, directly to worship. Take, for example, the story of Noah and the flood. God sets Noah and his family apart with seven pairs of clean animals and a pair of unclean animals. By the way, as a child, going back into my, uh, into my memory, I always remembered the two-by-two. Two. I always thought it was just two of each. Of course, they go on the boat two-by-two, two, but I guess I can... Blame the Irish rovers for that, right? <laughs> what were they? The green alligators and the long neck geese? The humpback camels and the chimpanzees. We read about the unicorns yesterday, right? Don't forget my unicorn. But why were there seven <coughs> pairs of, of clean animals and not just one pair? Right? And the answer is, to that is what happens immediately when Noah gets off the ark. And the first thing that happens when he gets off the ark isn't that he gets drunk. That's the second thing he does. <laughs> it's only 9 o'clock in the morning, right? I can hardly blame him. He builds an altar. Very first thing, he gets off the boat, builds an altar, and sacrifices the clean animals to God. If there had been only two, you have mass extinction. <laughs> 
But instead, there was this perfect number of seven pairs so that sacrifice could be made. Noah's setting apart leads directly to worship. The receiving of salvation. Life through death. I think we can probably find Jesus there somewhere. Maybe for another time. What about the story of Abram? Notice what happens when God sets him apart from Ur. He takes him from Babylon, the first return from Babylon. He takes him out with nothing other than his word. Promise. And at that promise, to your offspring I give this land. While Abram is passing through Shechem, what does he do? He builds an altar to the Lord. Abram doesn't just kind of worship as he walks around or anything like that. It was formalized. And then when Joshua goes into the land with God's people after uh, the, uh, the, the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, they go into the land, they start their conquest. Where does Joshua gather the people? Shechem. Not a random place. It's where God had first given Abram the promise of that land. There, God's people stood as his set apart, as his sanctified in this set apart land, remembering that promise of God and that it was fulfilled. That, of course, isn't the only example of worship and sanctification. We can stick with Abram for this. Notice the detail surrounding the sacrifice of Isaac. We've just had this uh, fifth Sunday in Lent. Genesis 22. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, <coughs> Isaac sat apart from Ishmael, the only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. Then Abram said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now it may seem insignificant and you might make a case that I'm grasping here, but the details are in the scriptures for a reason. He could have stayed in Beersheba, where he had been. But God had a specific place in mind, a specific set-apart place for this type of sacrifice. And Abraham says the same. You stay here, and I and the boy will go over there and worship. We're not staying with you. We're going over there, a set-apart place for worship. Just like with Shechem, and even more than Shechem, this place, Moriah, wasn't only set apart for a one-off worship experience. This place continued to be set apart through the years. Although it was a place that the Jebusites had inhabited, it was King David who went into the city and conquered it and made it his palatial headquarters. This Moriah is now buried under the modern streets of Jerusalem. But no matter how many others would come and tear down the city walls or burn God's temple, this was the place that God had set apart. And it would be this Moriah where 2,000 years later the father took his son, his only son whom he loved, Jesus, and sacrificed him there, the true lamb caught in the thicket by his brow. This setting apart by God leads to worship. What shall we say then? 
I'll stick with the major stories, the Exodus. What did Moses say over and over to Pharaoh? After he had made all of these excuses that he could think of why he wasn't the guy to go back to Egypt and to confront Pharaoh, God said that I promise I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us and now let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Exodus 3, two chapters later. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. After this, and a few plagues more, <clears throat> Pharaoh calls Moses and Aaron and says, uh, calls Moses and Aaron and says to them, Go sacrifice to the Lord within the land, is what Pharaoh says. But Moses said, It would not be right to do so, for the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go a three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. Point being, in the Exodus, God had already made a distinction between his set-apart people and the Egyptians. Egypt was not the place for the worship of Yahweh. Egypt was not the set-apart. It was the place from which to be set apart. So God gives his word, he gives his promises, and worship then follows. Of course, speaking of the exodus from Egypt... This is why Jacob was adamant that he would not be buried in Egypt. He told his sons that he was to be buried in the land. And not just anywhere in the land. Don't just cross over the Jordan and put my body in the ground. Take me to a specific place. The cave of Machpelah. Where Abraham and Sarah were buried. Where Isaac and Rebekah were buried. Where his wife Leah was buried. And as Joseph was dying, he reminded his brothers of the promise of God to deliver them back into the land. And consider, they weren't even slaves yet. But he made his brothers swear, do not leave my bones here. Take me into the land with you. Egypt was the place from which to be set apart dead or alive, God's people remained part of the promise. Once then in the wilderness, finally free, it's there that God gives His instructions concerning worship. <clears throat> For the first time, as freed and set apart Israel, these people would be able to gather together for worship. What would that look like? Would it be a free-for-all? Would each family do their own thing? Of course, I guess whatever works in your context, right? <laughs> Certainly not. You know, it's easy to get caught up in the details of Exodus 21 through 40 and Leviticus and all of this and to wonder what in the world the point is or to say, well, Jesus has come now. It just doesn't matter. We don't follow those laws Anyway, but look at the detail written in those texts of the vestments, the details of the tabernacle, the appointments within the tabernacle. I'm not going to read all of those details to you, but look at them yourselves. But as you go through and, and read these details, why is it all there? Is it to 
see who the serious Bible readers are and who can memorize what's in Exodus 24? No. It's because it's concerning the worship of God. It's distinct from what anything the world can give. It's entirely set apart from it all. Consider the restrictions of the people who can enter. There were to be no remnants at all of the things of the world in that space. The appointments within the tabernacle were to remind God's people of the perfection of creation. Even in the wilderness, inside the tabernacle, reminded of Eden. The details of the carvings, the, the leaves, the pomegranates, the gold. The priests didn't just mosey around in their wandering around clothes. There was order for them. There was structure. There was beauty. This was the place set apart by God as the place He would dwell with His set apart people. The space even had designated places where certain people could go and other people couldn't go. You know, you wonder, if we're going to speculate more, if this mixed multitude maybe had not yet been circumcised, they still had their outer courts of sorts to go in the wilderness. Of course, that's speculation. There was the holy place, set apart by a curtain from the outside where the Gentiles could be. And then the other inner curtain, set apart the most holy place from the holy place. God's people, of course, in the holy place, only the high priest in the most holy place, and once a year at that. God's people were very serious about this, too, for a while. We won't go through all of the kings and their abominations, but it's why the likes of Jehoshaphat, Joash, and Josiah were so instrumental in reform. But we can begin to understand why the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians and the exile was so devastating for God's people. No longer were God's people set apart in that way. Now, 700 miles from home, they were intermingled with the Babylonians. There were idols all around. They were unavoidable. A complete reversal from the days of Abram when he had been taken out of Ur and placed into the land. And now they were back where it all started. But God's people still had the promise of God once again to deliver them. And He did through Cyrus the Persian. And once back in the land, they rebuilt the temple. Not in any place, but back where it originally had stood. On top of Moriah, actually. In those days, we're well aware of what caused exile in the first place. So Ezra and Nehemiah, of course, come along with the cautions of the future. But the people don't listen, right? As the history of the intertestamental period unfolds, I'll admit, not all the time, but, but mostly, the things that start happening to God's people aren't necessarily self-inflicted. Antiochus IV comes along in 167 B.C. Forgive the long reading from 1 Maccabees, but it's very telling as to not only what he did to God's people, but what they were doing to themselves in order to assimilate into the culture. 1 Maccabees. In those days certain renegades came out from Israel and misled many, saying, Let us go and make a covenant with the Gentiles around us, for since we separated from them, many disasters have come upon us. So in other words, 
God's people were set apart from the Gentiles. And when they were set apart from the Gentiles, bad stuff started happening. So they said, let's just kind of join with the world again and these things will go away. This proposal pleased them. And some of them eagerly went to the king who authorized them to observe the ordinances of the Gentiles. So show up to the king and say, oh, we're just like you, we promise. We keep this Sabbath thing, and that's a little weird to you, but, but we're just like you. <clears throat> so they built a gymnasium in Jerusalem, according to the Gentile custom, and removed the marks of circumcision. I'm not sure how that works. But you talk about the lengths that God people, God's people would go to act like they were kind of with the world here. They abandoned the Holy Covenant. They joined with the Gentiles and sold themselves to do evil. Antiochus went up against Israel and came to Jerusalem with a strong force. So their joining with the world doesn't work, right? He arrogantly, this is Antiochus, he arrogantly entered the sanctuary and took the golden altar, the lampstand for the light, and all its utensils. He took also the table for the bread of presence, the cups for the drink offerings, the bowls, the golden censers, the curtain, the crowns, the gold decoration on the front of the temple. He stripped it all off. He took the silver and the gold, the costly vessels. He took the hidden treasures that he found. Taking them all, he went to his own land. Then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and that they should give up their particular customs. And all the Gentiles accepted the command of the king. Many even from Israel gladly adopted his religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. And the king sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and the towns of Judah. He directed them to follow customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices, and to drink and drink offerings in the sanctuary, to profane Sabbaths and festivals, to defile the sanctuary and the priests, to build altars and sacred precincts and shrines for idols, to sacrifice swine and other unclean animals, and to leave their sons uncircumcised. They were to make themselves abominable to every unclean thing and profane so that they would forget the law and change all the ordinances. And he added, whoever does not obey the command of the king shall die. So I know in the first part, and up until this part, and we've kind of talked about sons of God seeing that the daughters of men were attractive, but this has become cultural at this point. Give up your marks of circumcision. Give up your language, your culture, your customs. Become one with the world. Everything will be okay. And God's people did so. Antiochus defiled the set-apart temple with idols and with the blood of swine. But despite the fact that many of God's people had forsaken their set apartness, there were still yet that remnant, still those faithful who sought to restore what had been defiled. They came in and cleansed the temple. And what followed became the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah that you see in John chapter 10. This, of course, would not be the last of the Gentiles showing up to defile God's set-apart place where He meets His sanctified people. But the New Testament does tell us that what would come started with God's own people defiling that place. The temple during the intertestamental days was not just set apart for worship. It became the bank so to speak. So as a result, there were money changers and people who sold things. What was set apart for worship, set apart for sacrifice, set apart where God would meet His people was no longer. What set that place apart was the marble and the stones. See what beautiful stones this has, the disciples will tell 
Jesus. Herod the Great had done that to try to somehow gain the favor of the Jews. Even if it worked for just a short time, I mean, he was hated so much by God's people. And as their forefathers saw the destruction of the temple due to idolatry, that generation went too to the Romans. And we can see throughout the scriptures that God is not setting his people apart just for the sake of setting them apart. Whether it's a person like Noah or Shem or Abraham, Isaac or Jacob, or a place, whether Shechem or Jerusalem or the temple, God does so for a specific reason. And the reason, in one way or another, is always leading to worship. This worship is for God's people who have been set apart from the world. As Noah was from the flood, or Israel was from Egypt. So why then is it the tendency of the church to invite things in from which we have been set apart? Those things God's people for so long fought and died to keep out. We welcome with open arms. I'll make some practical application to this uh, tomorrow. I think it's necessary to make a practical application. I, I do have to keep up my uh, reputation of being a St. Louis guy and offer you some best practices. <laughs> but, uh, but just an example before I move on. You, know, you, you, you look at your own space a few years ago, I uh, did a class on church architecture, talking about uh, you know the, the simple things, the altar, the pulpit, all the way down to the very structure of the inside of our building. And I made the comment, and I and I made this really before I thought about it. And after I thought about, or after I made the comment, I thought maybe I should have said this a different way. But it was it was right. I asked people to look around, and I said, if there's anything in this space that doesn't help point us to Christ, it doesn't belong. Now, that'll get some looks, especially if certain things have been donated by certain people. <laughs> but it also gets us to consider how many things from the outside we have actually become reliant on or maybe that some are using this holy place of God for storage. For junk. In this way, a very seemingly simple way, maybe we have forgotten who we are as the set-apart people of God gathered in a place that is set apart by God where He meets His people. But again, as God's people today, we haven't learned very much. Maybe many in the church we see have decided that the best way to be a Christian is to marry oneself to the world. Like in the days of the Maccabees. I mean, I can't tell you how many evangelism strategies I've heard that talk about needing a cultural insider. One who knows the language of the world. One who can speak the language of the world to the world, right? You've got to build relationships with people before anyone will trust you and listen to you, right? Whatever happened to the Spirit, the one who sets apart, blowing like the wind where He will. It is not our job to come up with the best strategy to figure out how we can best communicate with the world. Our job is simply to proclaim the word that has been given to us by God. I mean, I wonder what the likes of Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego would think of the church in America and what far too many LCMS congregations have sold their soul to. 
it was Daniel, and Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego who stood firm, even while firmly set in Babylon. They stood firm on what they should eat and shouldn't eat. They stood firm with their literature and their language, even when Babylon was immersing them in a completely different culture. They remained uniquely God's set apart, whether lion's den or furnace. Far too many people no longer think this way, though. This kind of brings me back to my uh, earlier years in my Baptist and Lutheran upbringing struggle. I was raised each and every week, each and every youth group, each and every uh, youth retreat. The very end, I mean, the gospel, admittedly, could be, could be preached very well, but it was all undone at the end. Right? It was loaded with a challenge. Do this. We did the same thing in the Lutheran church. We've got an election coming up, so you know it's coming back around. You remember a blaze? This was all a big challenge. How many people have you told about Jesus? Put your, put your check marks by your name when you sign the register so we can count. And through all of this, ultimately we're being told that the church, as we gather as God's people on Sunday, it really isn't for us. It's for the ones outside. Now, before I'm accused of being an anti-evangelist or something like that, let me clarify. What we do on Sunday is for God's set apart. It's not for the world outside of our intercession for them. Sunday morning is for the baptized of God. It's where God meets us with forgiveness, life, and salvation. It's not a place for us to be burdened with the law, but to be restored by the gospel. And then we go out and proclaim this to the world through our vocations. You know this. I know you do, but things tend to be misconstrued, uh, especially from behind uh, this podium. I've seen quite a few videos from here. So what we don't need to confess is that you have to be a Christian to come to the divine service. But in what happens in that hour or so is not intended to be tailored to suit the ones of the world for the sake of feeling like the way you dress or chant might be a turnoff or weird to them. But maybe that is why so many set aside their set apartness ways of the world. Look at what's happened in our own church body in the last how many years, right? The liturgy forsaken out of fear that it was too hard to follow or not seeker friendly. The confession of sins omitted or adjusted. I mean, who wants to make the visitor say, I a poor, miserable sinner? That's not very nice. That's not very welcoming. The sacrament of the altar, abandoned, unless it was the first or third Sunday, right? Because you've got to have those Sundays where you can invite your Baptist grandma and not, and not offend her. So first and third it is. You know, we wouldn't want to be offensive to those people too when they show up on Lutheran School Sunday. That's not very nice. It's not very welcoming. But in doing all of this, in adjusting our practices, we're depriving God's set-apart people from the set-apart gifts and the very reason why they came in the first place. The Sabbath is made for you. It is the set-apart day for God's set-apart people. Consider all of these texts of the Scriptures where God is intentional about setting His people apart from the world for this very reason. The Antiochuses of the world, government, whatever, will continue to come along 
and to bring about and to order all kinds of abominations for us. And it will cause some people to forsake faithfulness or to take the easy way out and saying, oh yeah, we can reverse the marks of circumcision. We can use your language. We can do things the way you want us to do them. That's okay. I mean, look at all the abominations that, uh, that, that showed up during the pandemic. I mean, the Romans uh, even canceled their baptism. They weren't even, they weren't even baptizing their children. I hate to get too close to you. But this is our reality now. It has been for a while. We are once again living in these days of the intertestamental period. Maybe you like the image of the wilderness or Babylon better. But here we are, scattered, nonetheless. We are seeking faithfulness. Here we are, intermingled with pagans and idols all around. Here we are, trying to live as God's set apart in a land that uh, is kind of our own as they were in the intertestamental days in a land that was their own with their temple but intermingled with the rest a lot of strange things happening around them a lot of strange things happening around us there's quite the mixed multitude even within our own synod plenty to grumble about. But the things that we grumble about should never, ever be because we're hungry or thirsty unless we're the ones that have taken the food away from the table ourselves. First and third, right? Here exists our struggle. Does what we do as God's set-apart people matter? Should we care about order and structure? Should we care what the ones outside think about what we do inside? And the answer that we give needs to be more than, well, just because. That's never been the answer with God. There's always a reason. But there are still those lost in the world. So what's the response? What's the answer here? How do we engage the people of the world? I mean, remember the quote from Luther in his Genesis commentary. Adam wasn't just to kind of sit by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil all day, go eat from the tree of life, and then go sit by the tree again. He had an obligation to care for the garden. Admittedly, we are not of the world as God set apart, but we are still in it. So what does that look like? We'll uh, maybe look at this a little bit later as God's sanctified, as God's set apart, what that looks like in the divine service. The of Israel were told to, told to go into Jericho um, and destroy the city and take it over, and they were to sanctify themselves before they went in. And then, uh, how Rahab and her family gets set apart right. there also because she had heard of the covenant. And, you know, you wonder how many, and I don't know the answer to this, you wonder how many others in Jericho had heard about the covenant and said, ah, nah, right. you know, no thanks. Um, and then, um, after that, the, some, of the tri some from the tribe of Judah kept some of the accursed things back for themselves. And so 36 men of the children of Israel then died at A because some of the tribe of Judah had kept some back some of the accursed things. And then they had to sanctify themselves again after that. And then they had to circumcise the children who had been born while they were sojourning in the wilderness. And so it's, it, I mean, it's just interesting how they had to sanctify themselves again, set themselves apart again and how this setting apart comes through destroying those who are not set apart or who refuse to be set apart there. It's interesting how that, you know, where it's, you have in Egypt, it's an exodus out away from them, and now it's kind of more actively an attack from the people of God, actually.
so yesterday you said something about like the reason there's no Gentiles like it, because they actually become Jews, right? Um, and then you sort of have this in the New Testament. The same thing happens that the reason the church isn't Jewish anymore is because actually they give up their Jewishness, right? right? I mean, there's again, but but there is this you haven't really talked about yet, and maybe you're going to. Uh, when we're, we're being set aside together, right, there is a kind of unity and even maybe a uniform, um, you know, that, that uh, right, that, that what's going on when we refuse to be, right, when we won't put on the uniform, right, right? I want you on my team, great, but I'm going to wear the old jersey, you know, I, I wonder how that comes into it, or have you thought about that? How did you get in here? Yeah, this is wedding garment. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, this, right. This is all. This is all part of it. It's, yeah, and and I, and I will you know touch on this later, and, and it's maybe from a Babylonian perspective. It's yeah, I want to come in, but I'm gonna but I'm gonna keep my language. I'm gonna keep my literature. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep the old way of doing things because that's just the way I do. Things. This was my this was my struggle as a kid. It's like yeah, I can go to the Lutheran church, but I'll you know, go back and do things with my friends and I'll speak their language when I'm with them. I remember, it's funny the things that, the things you forget and the things you remember. We were playing, I went back, this, this was a strug struggle, all my friends were there, so my, my parents would drop me off at the Baptist church so I could go to Sunday school with my friends. <laughs> And they would pick me up to take me to church. And I remember playing a game. Everything was, it was games always. We were playing a game and we were having to come up with church words that started with, or letters, or words from the Bible that started with different uh, letters. And C came up. So, oh, communion. <laughs> it's like, wait. I'm, uh, you know, started to use language that wasn't, familiar I thought okay this is this is where things are starting to starting to shift so I think it there is you know if you're gonna you're gonna come in this is the language this is the ritual this is the culture and not say well we're going to change what we do because it may be offensive or or whatever and there is there is teaching with this too to be able to explain uh, why we do what we do not necessarily on a Sunday morning, but to have answers for that. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about, <clears throat> so when the people come out of Egypt, they plunder the Egyptians, and the early church makes a big deal out of using things like rhetorical skill or other things that have been learned and developed from the world. Um, talk a little bit about how plundering the Egyptians is misused in our day, and then how it should and ought to be used. Does that make sense? <laughs> I think I understand what you're saying, but before I start talking about it, can you talk about your uh, what you have in mind is misuse of plundering the Egyptians? Well, um, so plundering the Egyptians then becomes an overarching category to allow anything from the world that we find useful at the time. Right. So maybe that is screens in church. Sure. Maybe that is uh, more updated, funky music uh, in church. Maybe that's a whole host of things that I wouldn't consider plundering the Egyptians. I'd consider that them plundering us. Yeah. Right. But, but so what is the best way then to talk about um, the church's use of plundering the Egyptians and then how to move forward so that really the, the people of God understand what that is oh. and, and how then it can be uh, pressed into our service rightly and wrongly. I think, that, I think that's helpful. Uh, you know, what, what did God's people do with what they had plundered? I mean, they made a golden calf with it. On one hand, but right? then, they, then made, they had to eat it. And but then they also made the tap, the tabernacle right. and all its furniture. No, that's right. So, what is you know what is pleasing 
to God. Yeah. I mean, perhaps it's just uh, uh, God dictated to them what ought to be done with what they've received. Right. So are we are we doing what God has actually commanded, or are we not? I mean, maybe it's just as simple as that. No, this is this is right, and I, and I think the distinction in the wilderness is, is golden calf and, and tabernacle. One is, one, is, yeah. one, is, one is appointed for the proper things, yeah. and one, one, is, one is eating, drinking, and rising up to play, and there's, there is a, yeah. a, a sharp distinction. So if we're talking about music, if we're talking about mm -hmm. uh, screens or anything like this, what is, to what end? Yeah, yeah. Why, do we, why do we need a screen descending in front of the cross? Well, because that's the only place it fit. I remember yeah. going, to a, going to a church, it doesn't matter where, beautiful sanctuary, and just before the divine service started, down rolls this screen, right, <laughs> right behind the pulpit, right in front of the cross. I thought, yeah. okay, this is, that's a this is, this is, yeah. this is a confession. This yeah. is a confession. This is my focus now. Yeah. So, well, I think you make a great point. Just because no one ever, when they quote, "We're plundering the Egyptians," no one ever immediately moves to first the golden calf, and then the distinction and difference between then the accoutrements that go in the tabernacle. That's what I always, when, when we go through this, I always ask my kids to make this golden calf. Where did they get the gold? Yeah. <laughs> and it's gold's not just floating. Well. It's, you know, they're using yeah. these. They're using these good gifts from God. That God said, you know, "You'll be favorable in the eyes of the." They're going to yeah. throw this stuff at you, and the first thing you do with these gifts of God is craft an idol. Yeah. I think there's also. I mean, there's also the technology that they pick up. You know, the, the chariot, astronomy. You know, I mean, some of these things that they pick up from the Egyptians, that then they can use, right? Uh, but but are in themselves seductive, right? So so it's it's not that it's not that the technology is necessarily you know, right. But there's this okay, we're going to use chariots now or the longbow or whatever they get, you know. But at the same time, there, there's this problem that uh, there's a seduction in that. They're not neutral. They're not completely neutral. And if we're going to if we're going to use a longbow, it's going to change the way we hunt, and it's going to change the way that we communicate with one another. And you know, there's going to be a kind of a cost to this, and how do we protect? You know, kind of. You know, it's hard not to use a longbow once you know about it. But you know, is there is there? Some, I mean, there's there's a lot of questions here. I think that are more difficult than we typically think. I would too. Yeah. I mean, everything comes with a cost, yeah. right? You 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 bring something in, and it's it's almost impossible to see what the ramifications right. of bringing that thing in. And we've seen this with our school. You know, you, you, you bring in this teaching philosophy. Well, to, to what end? Right. Seems seems good. Seems like you're really loving the children. But but do you just is it? Well, see, yeah. Is it just mammon too? Mm -hmm. I mean, do we just want to use a longbow because it's more efficient, and we don't have to work as hard, right? And and uh, and then do we? You know, does it? I don't know. There, there's. It just goes on and on. It, it does. <laughs> and what if informs... you give a mouse a cookie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? No, it, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, or, it's, or a pig of pancakes. Or a loose muffin. Speaking of the changes that technology brings in, when a screen comes down, it, t it sends a, a message that this is a show. And what, and what I see happen sometimes in our churches is. During the divine service, people do treat it as holy. Like when they come up for communion, they bow. Um, there's a sense that you know during the service, the men don't wear hats. But then there's a sense that, okay, after the benediction now, um, the, the blood of Christ is now just a prop. Um, mm -hmm. And now we don't have to bow when we come to the altar anymore. And you know, I, I, one time I had a pastor who was visiting um, it, it, he was in my sanctuary. We were having to t discuss something. He came in the sanctuary and he just sauntered by the altar without reverencing it. And I was kind of like, I, I was taken aback and he just laughed at me for, for being... But I know during the divine service he would have piously put his hands together and bowed. But 
Nobody was around, you know. It was yeah. like the, the, the curtain has come down, the show's over, right. the, the blood of Christ that we bow and scrape before it's just wine again. You know, it's a, there's a sense that it's a show, and, and that's in opposition to the sense of holy, it's a holy place. Even if you're the only person in there, it's still holy because God is there, and the presence of God is there, and that doesn't go away, you know, at a certain time or when a certain thing happens when the lights come on. And so I think this is very, this is such an important thing to, to wrestle with and to, and to make everybody, clergy, laity alike, understand hold, what holiness is as opposed to the divine service as a performance. Right. Yeah. No, we, we had a, there was a tornado that came through Coleman in, uh, in 2011. And we, I mean, you would, you would look at our, our block that we have and say, oh, you've got a load of space. You can, you, you've got more space than you need. But during that tornado, two of our, we had two houses sitting on the block. One used to be a parsonage. And they were, they were destroyed. And this kind of adjusted our Bible class space and, and everything. <coughs> And now, ever since ever since I've, I've been there, even I'll teach teach Bible class in, in the church, in the sanctuary, and it. Uh, I mean, you're teaching the word, you're reading the word. What's the big deal? But but to me, it just seems it seems so strange because now instead of in front of the altar, now I'm, I'm turned. We're in the round, so I'm turned over here with my back. To the altar, you know, leaned on the podium, just kind of very, very casual, and it's just, you, you might think, well, that's, that's not really a, a big deal, you're teaching the word, you're answering questions, but, but it's, this is not what the space is, is for, yeah. right? We can do this in the gym, but, uh, you know, voters' assemblies, the same, same, you know, this is not a place for announcements and, and all of this, this is a place for the people of God to gather to hear the preached word, to receive the body and blood of Christ, to, to hear about Christ crucified. And that's, that's what you expect when you, when you enter. But it changes people's demeanor too, sauntering around or you know, having conversations about this or that, what did you do yesterday, all of this. It, it certainly changes. How come it only changes it one way? I mean, why don't they act more reverent in Bible class instead of acting less reverent in church? Right. But it, you know, we only degrade one way. <laughs> we better we better call it here.